All right, welcome back. Uh, it's time for our third speaker, so Anna Maria Lusardi. Uh, she's professor uh, at the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, moreover, she's the founder and academic director of Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center. And uh, Professor Lusardi is widely regarded as one of the founders of the field of financial literacy, in which we study how financial knowledge interacts with behaviors. She's also won numerous research awards, one of, one of which is the Swedish Scandia Award for Long-Term Savings in 2017, when we had the pleasure of having you here in Stockholm physically. Uh, but nevertheless, today we have to settle uh, for her digitally. Uh, so Anna, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Anders. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> and. Um, I would also have very much like to be in Stockholm again in person, but hopefully we will do it uh, again next year. What I'm doing today is actually a presentation which I haven't done uh, for many years. Uh, we started this project together with the TIA Institute. The TIA is one of the biggest pension fund in the US, mostly targeted to um, teachers and, and professors and, uh, and the education industry. And several years ago, we started this project about collecting early data to look at the personal finance um, of individuals and families. And the reason we had this long-term horizon and the reason why I didn't present this work for uh, four years now is because we really wanted to collect a lot of data to look at the personal finance um, of uh, Americans. And also um, because we, as you invest in the long term and uh, you collect data each year, you also hope that you know, some big event will happen. So you'll have data before and after this big event happen. And I have to say, this is the time to talk about big events, of course, being the pandemic. And let me start with that, uh, if I can send, uh, uh, move the presentation and I want to start with talking about how the personal finances of America look like before the pandemic and one of the um, uh, three facts I would like to highlight is that um, you know even though we all are requiring to uh, save in for our own pension as uh, Olivia mentioned in our presentation in fact many Americans have not even tried to figure out how much to save for retirement are not planning for retirement even though they have a DC contribution type plan interestingly also uh, many families in the U.S. were financially fragile, meaning they would not have been able to face an unplanned expenses of, uh, say, $2,000. So, you know, we are facing a huge shock, but in fact, many families would not have been able to face a small shock. And also one of the data I'm going to discuss, and we collected in the last uh, wave of the data, we ask how many hours people spend in dealing with their personal financial issues, and many spend as many as eight hours, a full day of work, worrying and dealing with personal finance issues, and some of these hours are spent at work. I want to give a picture which has been so much in the news in the US, which is the line of the food banks in the US. And this picture serves to say two things. First of all, this lining up at the food bank started a week after the government shut down. So as mentioned earlier, you know, many families do not have the precautionary saving to deal with a small shock, let alone a big shock. And even though you might not see directly on this picture, you know, these cars are not clunkers. You know, we are not looking at the poor people lining up, lining up at the food banks. This is the solid middle class lining up, lining up. And this is the same things that happened a, a year ago when the government shut down and government employees were furloughed. Actually, just a week after, they were again lining up at the food banks. So again, um, we see that a large proportion of uh, families do not have the capacity to deal with short-term shock, let alone uh, a big one. And this is why I'd like to talk today about uh, you know, personal finance knowledge, like the, the knowledge that we have to make the, the many financial decisions that we have to make uh, 
every day um, or regularly. Uh, I would like to identify some of the most vulnerable groups and then also speaks about, speak about some of the application and solutions to this uh, phenomenon that we see and the fact that many people, for example, have not saved or are not investing well, uh, are not uh, preparing for retirement. So let me start talking about this personal finance index. Uh, and uh, what it is, is uh, and I've reported here the definition we have used, is an annual barometer of the knowledge and understanding that people need to have to make good financial decisions. So it's a measure of the working knowledge. We not only assess whether people have this basic knowledge, but also whether they, they can apply that knowledge. So we are looking at, are people able to make savvy financial decisions? And in addition to looking at, the, at, at that kind of working knowledge, we are also looking at behavior, but in particular, we are looking at behavior related to well-being. Um, you know, of course, people do not save or borrow just uh, for that objective. They are uh, saving uh, to achieve financial security or they are borrowing to achieve certain objectives. So we need to keep in mind that the final uh, reason and the, the aim of people is, of course, to be financially secure. And we try to look a lot more, zoom in a lot more at well-being indicator than just behavior. And just uh, uh, to be more explicit, we have basically collected data each year on, on January, uh, it, uh, at, each, at the beginning of the, each year, uh, looking at the population 18 and older, and looking more or less at 1,000 respondents. Uh, as you can imagine, this is not enough um, to look at some specific subgroup, and that's why each year we have oversampled a specific subgroup. Just to give you just a preview, these are the report we have written to describe the main finding of the data. So we started in 2017 and each year we have collected uh, data. And each year we have also looked and zoom into a specific group. We started with the Hispanics, which are a very important uh, group of uh, the population and very growing part of the population in the US. Um, and something often that we don't know much about. Uh, in the second year, we look at the millennials. Um, and the millennials is also becoming one of the larger generation if you look at the labor market. In 2018, we look at African Americans and we are very happy to have done so before the attention on the Black Lives Matter movement. And we are about to release uh, the new subgroup in 2020, which is women. So, just to give you a sense of uh, what is unique also about this data set is, you know, you might be familiar with some of the questions measuring financial literacy that Olivia and I have designed. And these were a simple question. We only add the capacity and the space in the survey for three uh, or more or five questions. And so we had look at knowledge of this uh, very basic and fundamental concept, but here we didn't have that strict limit um, and we design, in fact, an index which has as many as 28 questions. And we look at eight fundamental functional area in which people make decision. We have chosen this area looking at the national standard for financial literacy. Basically, you know, these are the topics that you would cover if you were to teach a personal finance course. So these are the topic we cover as well. And for each of them, we have from three to four questions, which our previous work indicates are actually enough to have a good proxy of knowledge. And I also want to give you a sense of what are the questions we ask. While we ask some of the big three or big five, in case you're familiar with some of the financial literacy questions we have designed before, here we also ask questions related to can people apply the knowledge? Can people understand, do people understand the working of interest compounding? So I have a question here where, you know, Anna saves $500 each year for 10 years and then she stops saving and Charlie inherits actually $5,000 at that time and starts saving later. Who will have more money uh, 10 years later? 
So do people understand here that uh, saving early really matters and how, you know, in a sense, uh, loosely speaking, the working of interest compounding works. And our methodology of the question is the same as the big three and big five, which is we, uh, this question are multiple choices where people have indicate which is the correct answer with the capacity to say they do not know or can refuse to answer and they do not know responses are actually very important to pin down who are the people who, do, who know the least. And as you can also see here is about half of American can correctly answer these questions. And, and many, about one in five, actually do not know the answer to these questions. This is actually what we find as well uh, overall in the population. So, you know, if you see at how, um, at what's the proportion of questions that people are able to answer out of these 28, which assess knowledge of these eight topics, you can see more or less that only, uh, only half of the question are answered correctly by in the population. So if you only answer half of my test, you get an F. And so, um, you know, this is more or, less, more or less if I have to say, you know, if there is a, a number or a, a, a effect to get away from this personal finance index is that the knowledge that people have is quite low and it has changed very little over time. The improvement, even though we do see a little bit, uh, has not been very big. And because we have 28 questions, we can also zoom in on the distribution of those questions. And as you can see here as well, is there is a good chunk of the population, in fact, 20%, who cannot even answer or answer you know, less than seven questions. So not just the knowledge is overall low, but there is also a group of the population for which this knowledge is particularly low, um, while at the top as well, the proportion of people who know a lot is not very high. And fortunately, that, pro that proportion has, has gone up a little bit over time, but overall, we don't see big improvement in how much people know. Um, I've mentioned the eight topic. Um, and here you see uh, a distribution of who are the topics that people know the most or the least. And, you know, following up on what Luis said and also Olivia, that we see this huge transfer of risk from individuals, from the institution to individuals, that's really bad news because unfortunately risk, comprehending risk, insuring is actually one of the topics that people know the least. And this is a finding uh, that we have seen in almost every other survey I have done and is confirmed here as well. Investing as well rank relatively low. And what people know the most is actually borrowing, which is uh, important in the US because borrowing and, and debt is one component present in every balance sheet of American families, including the young that as you know, often start their economic life in debt. So overall, uh, you know, not only people um, know the least about certain topic, but that knowledge has also not in, improved over time. When we look at risk, we actually see no improvement. But who are the people who know uh, the least? Uh, not surprisingly, potentially, the young, um, unfortunately, those with low income, and also women. Um, our subgroup also allow us to zoom in in some specific group. Uh, the Hispanics as well are a group that know much less, for example, than the rest of the population. And as you can see also in the distribution of, you know, how little perhaps they know, a, a lot more Hispanics, uh, for example, can answer less than seven questions and very few are at the top. The same is true about the millennials um, as well. They are a group that uh, are not very knowledgeable. Same about the African-Americans. And uh, you know, we will show soon in the new report some of the important finding about women. Not only um, these groups are disadvantaged, but when we look at what are the groups that have acquired knowledge over time in this four year horizon, unfortunately, it is the people that were already knowing more. So over time, if any, knowledge is improving, but is improving in the group who know the most. For example, male, those with high education, 
those who are employed, and, uh, and uh, fortunately, those who are exposed to financial education, even though often the people who are exposed to financial education are those working in good jobs. So yet again, we are seeing that, you know, if any, um, we are moving toward a more unequal financial knowledge over time, even though it might be improving on average. So I want to stop for a moment and talk about, you know, an analogy um, or like think about how can we, you know, why do we care about financial literacy or financial knowledge? You know, uh, some, in the previous presentation, when we have discussed about solution, few people have mentioned improving or uh, uh, paying attention to financial literacy. But I think it's very important that we pay attention to financial literacy. And I think of financial literacy uh, as a water in an ecosystem, meaning a system is composed of many parts, you know, so of course we need a good financial structure, we need a good choice architecture, we need good financial product, we need potentially a good financial advice industry, but we also need people to have that basic knowledge that allows them to use that ecosystem well, because you cannot nudge everywhere and in every direction. So for example, we have nudged people to contribute to retirement account, but now that we have taken away the possibility or that we have given people the possibility to borrow against those accounts, they have borrowed so much against those accounts. And so, you know, people, if they don't have the knowledge, they might be doing and making bad financial decision at a certain point in their life and potentially overcoming the benefit of having accumulated for retirement. One, one thing that worries me about the retirement system is we have spent a lot of time making people accumulate for retirement, but how about the accumulation phase? What if people have access to all of that money and then they, are, they can actually invest poorly later on for their accumulation side? There is a reason to worry about this because when we link um, financial literacy, our personal finance index to indicator, for example, of our people planning for retirement, it is disproportionately those who have higher knowledge, who plan for retirement, save regularly. And also uh, it is those who have more uh, basic financial knowledge who are also less financially fragile. Going back to the picture of the car lining up at the food banks, as you can see, there is a very strong monotonic relationship between those who have little knowledge and those who are actually able to put aside um, precautionary saving to deal with uncertain event. One of the pictures that uh, comes from our uh, last report is about how many hours per week people spend dealing with personal finance issues and problem. And as you can see here, People uh, spend from as many as 12, uh, 12 hours a week uh, dealing with these personal finance issues, and they are disproportionately those who know the least. So uh, financial illiteracy is expensive and can uh, lead to a lot of, uh, uh, has a lot of implication for behavior and including how we deal with these personal finance issues and also some of these hours are spent at work. You know, we might think that people under report the hours spent at work, but actually here we see that uh, some of the low knowledge people spend as many as six hours at work uh, dealing with their personal finance issues. So because of this, what can be done? And I want to talk about two potential solutions, which are uh, scalable and I think feasible. One is financial education in school. Um, you know, I think that given the many decisions that we have to make, given that we face a different retirement system, given how important it is that we make good decisions, personal finance can and should become a topic in school starting very early and also uh, in college. I teach a personal finance course and over time it has become a very popular course in particular in the US where people are dealing with uh, student loan and, and many other issues even when young, this can be a very important topic. But another 
um, initiative which uh, bring promises is uh, financial education in the workplace. This is where people are. Um, you know, this is today we have they, they have to deal with the decisions about how much to contribute to a retirement account, how much to withdraw from that account. And so there are a lot of opportunities, for example, to do this uh, financial education in the workplace, financial wellness in the workplace, in the same, uh, the same way in which uh, workplaces now offer gyms and all this, uh, this type of benefits. We can also add a personal wellness part. Um, and we have designed, using this data, many of these programs uh, also targeting specific groups because everyone is different and some of them are available on our website. Um, so I think actually this data can be used. I've only give you uh, a little snapshot of some of the findings, but uh, you know, TIA, for example, has used it to design better program for their financial advisor, um, even for their financial instrument, and also to advise many university on what they can do to help uh, teachers and professor uh, save and invest better uh, for, uh, for their retirement. And just to conclude, I just want to conclude going back to the slide I presented at the beginning, which is that even before the pandemic, there was a crisis in the personal finance of many families. And there is no wonder that we had to come up right away with very emergency uh, uh, plans in order to support people. Many of them would not have been able to survive you know, a few months without a paycheck. And what this data also indicates, it is disproportionately those who have low knowledge, which are fairly, uh, faring so poorly. And it's not because they have lower income and lower education, we account for that as well. But financial knowledge provide a very important tool in the toolkit today, we deal with the decision that we are doing. And those who have that knowledge fare so much better on every dimension. And I want to conclude with uh, these slides about living well. And the reason why my slides are all these spaces, we have to remember that the personal finance is personal. It is about the life of people. And in the same way in which today, you know, we have rules about, uh, you know, what we can eat in order to live well, uh, the importance of not smoking, exercising, and so on, I think it's important that we also have good financial practices so that we can um, you know, be financially secure. And that's why financial literacy is such an important uh, toolkit and such an important skill that people need to have in order to live well today. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. That was an excellent presentation. Very interesting. So, um, I have a question. I guess um, many people out there uh, are curious about uh, implementation. So do you have anything that you can share with us about how firms or the um, insurance and pension industry would apply this in their work? Do you have an experience from the US about this? Yeah, so we have designed several, uh, for example, financial wellness programs. Um, and we, we have, um, you know, use a lot of the uh, of the data from this project to design these programs, and so you know, often these programs are related to um, you know a simple test where people can assess you know the type they are, and so by assessing also their financial sophistication, we we can segment them in several parts, and then kind of created building blocks of these personal finance decisions. And some of these buildings blocks start with helping people adding precautionary savings because without those savings, actually, you know, without having that liquidity, they might get in trouble and they might end up borrowing more or also tapping into the retirement saving. Also helping people, of course, for this more longer term decision, but one component, and I haven't heard that mention this, but this is actually very important in the US, we uh, pay a lot of attention only on the asset side of the balance sheet. But when you look at the personal finances, and this data clearly uh, shows that 
people are deal and have a lot of problem in managing debt. Um, and that has to be a very important part, I think, of many financial wellness, because it is often that that creates trouble with people. We have also seen it in the financial recessions. Um, and, and so one of our components of the financial wellness program is not just saving and maximizing all of the benefit at the workplace, but also managing debt, which can be quite important. And we have, um, by the way, we have worked with a variety of, uh, of uh, firms and the clients, and we have even worked with um, football players, um, which has been a very interesting project because as you know, these are very wealthy people, uh, but they are also very young and really show very little financial literacy. So, you know, there is, uh, you can teach and you can train anyone, including football players. So, you know, just to show that we, um, you know, we face many challenges, but I think we have been able to help people in many different decisions. I have time for one more. So I was also thinking about measurements. I'm, I'm very jealous about your P fin index. We have done some uh, work here in Sweden, as you would know, but not a reoccurring panel, which seems to be the sensible way to go if you want to measure these things over time. Is this something that other countries have been uh, deploying as well, or is it only in the US? Uh, I'm not aware of a project like this done uh, in other countries and also so focused on the personal finance, but I hope it is going to start in other countries as well. I mean, I cannot tell you just how rich this data is and how um, many more insight we have gotten from this data, which we couldn't get in, we could not have gotten from other data set. And yet again, I really want to mention the, the advantage of doing it each year right, is that when something big happen, you know, you will have data before and after. And so you can help policy in a very important way. And so for example, you know, we have spent a lot of time in the past two or three months arguing that, you know, there was a personal finance crisis, you know, well before the crisis. And that's why it's so important to provide help to families very quickly. But going forward is also important to, you know, do prevention and make sure that people are better prepared for this. So they are not just dependent on the decision of the policymakers. All right, so if there are any uh, people out there in the audience that want to fund this panel in Sweden, uh, I think both Anna and me would volunteer to uh, make that happen. So thanks very much again.